Okay. All good? Yes. Okay, awesome. So let's just, yeah, start off right away. Let's go to the roll call and then we'll, yeah, jump right into it. Okay. Um, committee member Chen? Here. Committee member Larson? Here. Committee member Peterson? Here. Chair Fassoon? Here. And tonight, uh, absent members are committee member Breeding, Vice Chair Mira Venkatesh, and committee member Mohammed. Okay, um, let's dive right into the land acknowledgement and then we can get started. Um, so the city of Albany recognizes that we occupy the land originally protected by the Confederated Villages of Lijon. We acknowledge the genocide that took place on these lands and must make strides to repay the moral debt that is owed to this indigenous people, specifically the Ohlone tribe. We thank them for their contributions which have transformed our community and will continue to bring forth growth and unity. The city of Albany commits to sustaining ongoing relationships with the tribe and together build a better future for all that now make this their home. Then we can jump right into item two, which is the approval of minutes. Does anyone have any comments or edits or concerns with the April 20 minutes? I'll make a motion to pass the minutes. Great. I'll second. Okay. Committee member Chen? Aye. Committee member Larson? Aye. Committee member Peterson? Aye. Chair Fassoon? Aye. Motion carries, minutes pass. Okay, and let's move on to item three, which is public comment. Um, so this is where members of the public can speak on items not on the agenda and each person will get three minutes to speak. Does anyone from the public have any comments? I see no hands raised. Okay, then it looks like we can just go on. Um, so let's just go on to item four, which is announcements. Um, so let's start off with item 4-1, which is sustainability events and resources. Great. Thank you, Chair Fassoon. Uh, just two announcements I'd like to make this evening for upcoming events. This Friday, May 20th, is Bike to Wherever Day, otherwise known as Bike to Work Day. And there will be an energizer station in Albany at Solano and Masonic. If you're interested in learning more, you can visit bikeeastbay.org. Um, and Michelle is, has been hard at work at the heat pump rebate program. And that program will launch on June 1st. So hopefully that will uh, increase the amount of heat pumps we're installing due to those rebates. And then I'd just like to take a few minutes to let you know about um, our community expo and compost giveaway that took effect that, sorry, took place on April 30th. Uh, for the compost giveaway, we gave away 1,080 bags of compost, which is about 40 cubic yards, wow. which is as many pallets as you can fit on a semi truck uh, <laughs> to over 250 residents. So we're very excited that we were able to give so much compost out to the community um, and are looking forward to doing another event soon. But in the meantime, if anyone would like to pick up compost, I encourage you to visit stopwaste.org's website to learn about their community compost hubs. One just opened in Alameda and any Alameda County resident can go pick up free compost from that compost hub. And also on the same day, April 30th, uh, Johnny and Michelle held a table at the Community Expo and they interacted with Albany community members and shared information on heat pumps, uh, including a uh, demo made of cardboard that Michelle made, uh, waste and recycling resources, rebate programs, the local road safety plan and information on carbon free Albany. And I know Albany Climate Action Coalition was there, Stop Waste was there and East Bay Community Energy was there as well to uh, provide resources and information to the community. Sorry, and Albany High Green Team. Um, so Committee Member Peterson and Chair Fassoon, if either of you would like to speak to your experience at the expo, 
please feel free to do so. No, it was great. It was great to see everyone there. I thought the city staff did an excellent job. I think they said they had about a couple thousand people come through. Is that what is that what you heard? Yeah. And um, it, it was, I mean, it was just fantastic to see all the different community groups that were present and, and presenting uh, information. So, uh, you know, first big all-in-person event in Albany, I think it was a success. It was really fun. Yeah, definitely um, echoing what community member Peterson was talking about. Um, it was great to see so many different people come of all ages um, and get to learn more about what the community is doing and especially get to get involved with kind of action. Um, so it's really exciting to see like all of Albany come together in this one space since it definitely hasn't happened in quite a while. So it was great to see. Great. That's all I have for announcements on 4-1. And thank you, Chair Fasoon and Committee Member Peterson for adding your input. Um, at this point, I'll pass it to Michelle for an update on the multifamily electric vehicle charging pilot program. Thanks, Lizzie. Yeah, so the, um, the pilot program is beginning to get underway. We have opened the applications. Um, we did that, I think, just before our uh, meeting in April. And the application period closes this Friday, May 20th. We've already received two applications, so I'm excited about that. And, um, and then after that, we'll be starting to review them. So making good progress there. That's um, applications from the um, landlord or, or owner of the- Yeah, from the building owners. Cool. I had a, a question that's interesting. Uh, there was a gal at the expo who lives in a condo, uh, I think it's like an eight or 12 unit condominium over near the plaza. And I, it sounded like, well, that's a multi-unit building, but we're looking more at apartment buildings, right? Um, I mean, that's basically the same thing, I guess. Yeah, you mean like a condo versus Right, these are all, um, well, I assume they're all owner occupied, maybe some of them are rented out, but um, she she lives in a, a condominium she owns in this multi-unit building. So there's a homeowners association. Yeah. Um, so I wasn't quite sure if I should direct her <laughs> towards that. Um, yeah, but... I actually did get in contact with the person you're speaking of and told her about the program. Um, it is technically open to condo buildings as well, um, although this, some trickiness potentially with that, but um, but we did open it up to those as well. That's all. Great, thank you, Michelle. Moving on to item 4-3, local road safety plan website is live. Uh, you can find that at albanysafestreets.com. And on this website, you can provide input on um, increasing safety as it relates to transportation in the city of Albany. And we'd really like to hear everyone's feedback. And I imagine our four committee members here are probably big active transportation participants. So we would love your feedback and anyone in the audience, we'd appreciate yours as well. And regardless, please spread the word about albanysafestreets.com. That's all I have for announcements. Are there any questions or comments from the public? I see no members of the public with their hand raised. So back to you, Chair Fasoon. Okay, um, so it looks like we don't have presentations tonight. So we can jump right into item six, um, which is discussion and possible action items. Um, on matters related to the following items. So 6-1, let's start off with the City of Albany All-Electric Ordinance. Thanks, Chair Fasoon. Let me share my screen. Everybody see my presentation okay? Great. Yes. All right. So I'm gonna chat with you all about the draft All-Electric Ordinance that we sent to you with your agenda packets this month. Um, there we go. Sorry. 
how to get it working. All right, so a little bit of background. Um, so just to start with building codes in general, um, the state green building code is called Cal Green. And this is a very large building code that encompasses all kinds of measures related to green building. And it's required for all buildings in the state of California. Um, now, every city is required to adopt that building code and adopt it every three years when it's updated. Um, the newest version is going to go into effect on January 1st, 2023. However, in addition to that, local governments can also adopt additional requirements that kind of go above and beyond that building code. And the city of Albany has already done that. Um, in 2020, a subcommittee of the Climate Action Committee worked with me to develop um, a group of green building measures which was recommended by both the CAC and the Planning and Zoning Commission and then adopted by council in January of 2021. And then an updated resolution to that was adopted in December of 2021 that added some requirements for mid and high rise buildings. Um, that measure or that resolution is actually delayed right now because of the California Energy Commission um, moving very slowly on on accepting these things, unfortunately. Um, but our first green building resolution is currently in effect. And to give you guys a little bit more info about the resolution that we have in place right now, it's known as an electric preferred reach code. Reach code just being a, a term for these kinds of uh, local amendments. Um, and by electric preferred, that just means that it incentivizes all electric building rather than requiring it. So it is still possible to build a new mixed fuel building in the city of Albany. However, for those mixed fuel buildings, there are higher energy efficiency requirements. And so that adds some costs, it adds complexity, and it, it just creates that incentive for people to choose all electric building instead. There are quite a few other green building measures in that resolution that are not related to electrification, things about you know, permeable paving, low carbon concrete, water efficiency. Um, I'm not gonna go into all that tonight. We are going to be updating those with this new building code, but I'm gonna come back to you in a little while once we, we have the final codes um, accessible to us to, to get into all of that. So I'm having trouble flipping the pages here. It's been slow. Um, so to focus just on the all electric ordinance part of this, um, all electric ordinances are pretty simple in that they do what they sound like. They require new buildings to be built all electric with no natural gas. Um, and there are basically two roads to do that. The first is a building code amendment or what's generally known as the all electric ordinance. And this just requires that new buildings only use electric appliances instead of gas ones. And the way it's done is through this amendment to the, the state building code that I mentioned earlier, adding measures onto Cal Green. This has to be readopted every three years along with the building code. Um, you know, every time the building code changes, we would have to readopt that amendment to it. And this is very, well, not very, but pretty common in the Bay Area. There are 30 jurisdictions that currently have an all electric ordinance. Um, this is also the version that staff recommends and um, can be seen in the draft ordinance that we sent to you. The other option is what's called a municipal code ordinance or a natural gas ban. Um, and this is a slight difference in that it technically bans natural gas infrastructure in new buildings. So it says you can't, you can't connect a natural gas pipe to a new building. Um, and instead of doing the building code thing, it's using the city police power, which basically is a, a kind of broad power that allows cities to pass laws for the general health and welfare. Um, and one of the positives to this is that it doesn't have to be readopted. You pass it once and you're done. Um, this is the method that Berkeley uses in a few other cities. It's not nearly as common. Um, and 
part of the reason why is because the city police power aspect of it is a little squishier. It's not quite as you know tried and tested, um, which makes it a little bit less riskier from a legal standpoint. In terms of the impact, they both do almost the identical thing. You know, requiring electric appliances versus banning natural gas infrastructure. Either way, you're ending up with an all electric building. So that's why staff is recommending the building code amendment um, versus the natural gas ban. So with that in mind, um, we have this draft ordinance that we sent to you um, that is the building code amendment version. And the bread and butter of it is that requirement that it states in there that new buildings must be built with all electric appliances. However, there are a few areas um, that kind of have some different, different approaches you can take and where we're mostly looking for your feedback tonight. And they really have to do with which buildings specifically this applies to. So the first area to think about is for ADUs, accessory dwelling units. These are often included as kind of new buildings in these all electric ordinances. Um, even though they're on a lot with an existing building, they're, they're new. Um, however, there's, there's usually some sort of exemption. So oftentimes attached ADUs will be exempted. So an ADU that shares a wall with the existing building, because these usually don't need new appliances like water heating and, and the HVAC systems that can just connect with the existing house. Um, some other cities exempt small ADUs like under 400 square feet or something to that effect. Um, we recommend going with this option of exempting the attached ADUs. Another way of doing it would be um, basically to say that an ADU, any new appliance in the ADU has to be electric. So, you know, if they're installing a new water heater, but not HVAC, then the water heater would have to be electric. That's, you know, a little bit more pointed, also maybe a little bit more complicated when it comes to plan check. Um, but two kind of similar options there. And then there's building types. So a lot of cities will exempt certain types of buildings. For instance, restaurants are a really common one. Scientific labs are another common one. Um, you know, just kind of finding a group where you know you're going to have a lot of problems and just kind of cutting them out of it um, off the top. Staff recommends exempting scientific labs for this reason. You know, they often require some really specific equipment or appliances or conditions. Um, so we foresee there being potential issues with that. That in mind, we don't actually expect to have any new scientific labs built in the city. It's, it's not very common here. So this exemption probably wouldn't have a big difference either way if it's included or not. Um, the more important one is kind of a general exemption for infeasibility or financial hardship. This is something that we already have in our current green building resolution. Um, and basically, you know, there's always going to be cases where there's, there's something weird with the lot or with, with the situation and it allows them to, to apply for an exemption and the city staff can kind of look at that and see if there's a real, real hardship there, um, you know, some kind of unusual case. So we do recommend including that uh, kind of general exemption. And then finally, there's the question of major alterations. Um, so this is, this is another common one in a lot of city um, all electric ordinances. The line between new building and major alteration is often kind of fuzzy and every city has their own definition of it. Um, our recommendation would be to use the same trigger as we have already for fire sprinklers. So right now, if the area of new construction plus the area of substantial remodel is larger than 50% of the existing area, then they have to install fire sprinklers in the building. So this would use that same trigger to say, okay, you have to go electric if you, if you hit those criteria. Um, the benefit of this is that we already have systems in place to find those buildings and kind of, you know, catch them and, and have a whole process for it existing. Um, I did take a look today and we have about 15 projects per year that have to put in the fire sprinklers and about a third of them we're already replacing their water heating and HVAC systems. 
Another third were replacing one of those systems. And then the final third wasn't replacing either. Um, so, you know, I think it would be relatively easy to fit into those projects. And it would also add 15 projects to the, the group that would fall under this ordinance. So um, the other option is from the model ordinance that we base this off of, off of um, and that's if the building is replacing 50% of the existing foundation or the frame above the sill plate. This is actually a bit of a, a more, I think there'd be fewer buildings that fall under this category. Um, it's a little bit more specific and wouldn't include like additions as much. Um, so I think we'd actually get a smaller pool of buildings falling under this and it'd be a little harder to find them. Okay, so moving on from those to get into the sense of what this would really mean for the buildings, um, the building owners, um, and that's cost. So when calculating the cost difference between a new gas or mixed fuel building and a new electric building, a really important thing to think about is the new building code, which is actually going to require all mixed fuel buildings to be electric ready, to have all the wiring and everything in place for electrification, and also to have heat pump HVAC systems in place. So new buildings are already going to be really close to all electric. So that, that step up that we would be requiring if we pass this ordinance would basically just require the water heating, stoves and drying to be the electric appliances versus gas. In terms of the cost for that, for most buildings, it's pretty small. For single family ADU, the water heating is about $1,000 extra. Stoves and dryers are pretty much on par. And then they would actually save about $6,000 from not installing the natural gas infrastructure, which can be quite expensive. For multifamily, it's a little different. Again, stoves and dryers are about the same. The electric water heating can be up to $100,000 more for the large buildings. That technology hasn't quite caught up yet for the multifamilies as much. So there's potentially a large cost there, but not for every building. And then they would be saving about $14,000 on the natural gas infrastructure costs. So for the most part, it's actually less expensive to build electric now, um, although not in every case. Then in terms of impact on um, you know, natural or greenhouse gas emissions in the city and, and just in general, how many buildings this would touch. Um, per year, we have um, about 15 ADUs, most of them detached ADUs. New buildings, um, there's about one single family building per year. Um, and then, you know, I included this five year period for the new buildings just because there's so few commercial and multifamily buildings. It's, you know, it's only one of each in those in that five year period. So pretty minor. It's mostly the ADUs. And then, of course, the larger multifamily buildings. So right now we have three multifamilies in the planning stages, 269 units total. And those will not be subject to this ordinance almost certainly because they're too close to submitting the permits that, you know, it's just unlikely that we'd be able to pass this and have it in effect in time for that. There is another building that's in planning stages that might be subject to this, just kind of depending on things how, how things play out. And then in the future, we know that these large buildings are becoming more common. That's, that's part of a lot of our overall planning and zoning work that we've been doing, it's becoming more common in the area. So we will definitely be seeing many more multifamily units um, coming soon that this ordinance would affect. In terms of the emissions reductions, um, compared with the mixed fuel building under that 2022 code, we'd see a reduction of about one metric ton of carbon dioxide per year for a single family, half a metric ton for an ADU, and about a quarter of a metric ton per unit in multifamily buildings. <clears throat> so I know that was a lot of information. Um, just finishing it off here with the next steps. Um, tonight, what we're really looking for is just your feedback, especially your thoughts on those questions of which buildings to include and exactly how to frame that. Um, 
I'll be returning soon with some, um, some information on those non-energy related green building things um, to talk about how we might update those. We'll put them together into a, a larger, more finished ordinance, um, bring it to the Planning and Zoning Commission. Um, and then if that is recommended by the Climate Action Committee and or the Planning and Zoning, then we'll present it to council. So that's, that's kind of the, the timeline we're looking at here. There's no motion that's necessary tonight. Uh, we're really just looking for feedback to kind of help help us build this draft up and, and get it closer to its final stage. <clears throat> okay, any questions? It looks like we have two committee members with questions. Um, committee member Larson. Yeah, thanks, um, Michelle. Nice. Uh, recap of all that. Um, can you go back to the municipal versus something slide? Yeah, let me bring it back up. I can remember the terms municipal versus something building code amendment. Yeah. So it sounded like if the building code amendment is the sort of the lower bar to get past, but the readoption part kind of, I just had a question about that. It sounds like the readoption was like, if if it doesn't get passed, then it kind of reverts back to the old way. It is and then the municipal code is like it gets codified into a higher standard where it's if it doesn't get renewed, it just stays at that level. Is that sort of the difference? Yeah, basically. Um, I think you know one important piece of context is that every three years we adopt the new building code. That's like a process that already happens within the city. Okay. So it would be pretty simple to adopt the new building code and readopt this <clears> ordinance, <throat> and we wouldn't really have to change anything but the year. Um, so that's that's what it would look like in practice. There is always, of course, the risk that a new city council might choose not to readopt this. Right. Right. However, well, I think it's pretty likely that by the time we get to the next building code cycle or the one after that, the state code might be all electric. Okay. Okay. I mean, I, I agree the inertia and the, the movement feels like it's going in that continued direction, but I always worry about like, you know, if some city council comes in five years from now, that's much more adverse to this, then it would just sort of be easy to, to, to fall back. Whereas the municipal code would be harder for them to revert back and just a, in a one-off kind of situation. So what's the, what's the, what's the, 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 the hurdle for the municipal code ordinance? I think the main hurdle with that is that it's legally riskier. We have more example, you know, the, the building code amendment is something that's really common. You know, people do building code amendments all the time and the all electric version of that, you know, there's 30 jurisdictions just in the Bay that have done it. There's examples of people suing those jurisdictions and losing. So our, our legal team feels more comfortable with that option. I think the city council is likely to feel more comfortable with it too. Okay. Um, the municipal code ordinance, um, you know, Berkeley was sued and that lawsuit was decided in favor of them, but has been appealed and is technically still in court. Uh -huh. You know, it could, it could turn the other way. So I think that's the main downside is that there's, it's just, a, it's less firm ground, legally speaking. Okay. Thanks. Committee member Peterson. Yeah, so um, following up on that, um, I, I, I was a little confused earlier when we had talked about this a couple years ago, we were advised, oh, we can't do it because we can't get um, Energy Commission to sign off on it. I guess things have kind of changed a bit, so it's more common to do this or somehow that that trail has been blazed. So doing a building code amendment is fine, whereas before it wasn't. Yeah, that's been changing in the last few years. Um, mm -hmm. The big shift is actually that the CEC has um, has told other cities that if they do an all electric building code amendment, they don't even need to send it to the energy commission. Oh, okay. So that's, that, that was a big, that's change. new. Yeah. yeah. That's huge. Um, 
So that, and that actually shortens the process quite a bit because we don't have to wait for them to approve it. The, the other thing I was saying with, with the municipal, just no gas anywhere, isn't that more blunt? I mean, um, here we can say, well, labs can have gas or, or could you do those kind of exclusions in a municipal? Yeah, many, I mean, not that there are many of these, but in general, they will have some exemptions as well. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, I had a, a couple comments on this. Um, one, I, I really like the idea of using the already established um, what's a major remodel the, the, where we, we require sprinkling as the basis for doing this. And I especially like that, that if that captures more, that's better. Um, so that's my comment on that. Uh, on the ADUs, I would be, I would err more on, since they're pretty small and they only have, you know, they could be tied to hot water in the existing building if they're, they're kind of there. Um, but if they have new appliances, say a cooktop, that should be electric. So is that- Committee member Peterson, before we go into discussion, we should just do questions and then open it to public oh, comments. Okay, so I don't have any more questions. Any other questions? Uh, yeah, one question. Um, so one thing I was just wanted clarification on um, for the electric ordinance versus the um, municipal code change, does that affect like infrastructure in any way? Like for example, in the building code amendment here, it says that new buildings should use all electric appliances. Does that mean there would still be a gas line running to new buildings? by default or, I, I mean, I guess in the cost section, it said that natural gas infrastructure costs were reduced there, but um, what what is that actually for? Is that for like the actual pipes running to your house or? Yeah, so when a new building is built, they will add a gas pipe to connect to that new building. Um, but if they choose to build all electric, they'll just forego that process and there won't be any gas piping in the building. I mean, if it's over an existing lot, there might be existing pipes lying around, but in general, they won't be connecting any gas pipes there because there's no purpose to that. Um, and that's how they save that 6,000 or $14,000 because they're just, they're not spending the money on it. Okay, makes sense. Any other questions? Member Peterson. Oh, is that just a hand from the board? Um, can you remember Larson? Is that a question? Yeah, it is. Um, on the ADU, um, can you just say again what, what our proposal is? I was a little confused about what our actual proposal would be. Yeah, so the, the staff proposal that we put in the ordinance draft is to exempt attached ADUs. Um, I brought up the other option of which, sorry. What is it exempt ADUs? We would we would exempt like we wouldn't require this for attached ADUs. So any ADU where it's sharing a wall with the existing house. And what's the reasoning for that? So in general, most of the time those attached ADUs aren't using new water heaters or HVAC systems. They're just plugged okay. into the existing house. Okay. Um, right. So the idea is that it, you know, it wouldn't we wouldn't be um okay, okay. But, but detached adus would have a, a all electric yeah environment. okay all right thanks mm -hmm. looks like it okay okay chair fasoon i don't know if you're ready to call for public comment yeah, let's go into it. Um, would any members of the public, do they, anyone have any comments? If any oh. members of the public would like to speak on this item, please raise your hand. Okay, no comments. I think oh. we just got one. Yes. Lucinda? Lucinda? Yes. Um, hi. Uh, thanks, Michelle. I think this is a really great um, 
um, development that uh, this is being uh, getting close to uh, being able to actually become a proposed uh, building code change. And um, I do like the idea of tying it of the two options, tying it to the sprinklers um, rather than the other option. Um, and um, I think this would be a uh, would really like to see our city follow the lead of uh, many other communities in um, in moving towards this and whether it's uh, through the building code or municipal code change. Um, you know, I don't, I don't think that's as important. Um, and if going with the building code is going to uh, be a less risky option, I'd, you know, I'd totally support that. Thank you. Okay, next we have David Wemmer. David? There we go, unmuted. Um, yes, I'm just excited to uh, hear of this moving forward um, in this fashion. I wanted to just, you know, support it, its continual uh, movement forward. And um, I just you know, appreciate uh, that we're actually, you know, being more proactive in, uh, in, uh, in this, um, area here that we can make make a difference instead of um you know um what we were what we what was proposed before i like um, i like this is a another level up and i uh, uh, fully support it that's it thank you great any other members of the public that would like to speak to this item please raise your hand Okay, back to you, Chair Fasum. Um, if no one else has anything to add, then I think we can move on. I think now we're at the discussion section. Oh yeah, sorry, discussion. Um, yeah, Committee Member Peterson. Yeah, so um, I, I, I'd also like to express my, you know, just to clarify with Michelle that, yeah, I do really, um, think that modeling it after what establishes a major remodeling based on fire sprinkling would be a good choice. So I am uh, recommend that. Uh, that's where my vote is. And then as far as the ADUs, I, I kind of liked your second option, which even if they are attached, they could still get like hot water from an existing hot water system. But if they put in new appliances, like I, I wouldn't want them piping gas out to the ADU portion itself. So what we want to avoid is that they sort of install further gas distribution into the ADU. So making any new appliances that are in the ADU itself be electric would be my vote. So I, I, I think that um, goes on. And that's it. Thank you very much for doing this. This is great to see this happen. Um, yeah, I, I had a couple more questions actually. Um, there were actually two things I was wondering about that I probably should have asked about earlier. One is there's a section in the ordinance on tenant improvements. Can you explain what that is about? Um, I believe that's for commercial buildings. Um, it's pretty common for when a new tenant moves into a commercial building, they change a few things around basically a remodel of the building. Um, and so it's just clarifying that that doesn't count as a new building. Okay, so that's specifically for like, if there's a commercial building, um, someone moves in, would they be able to install like, I don't know, like a gas appliance? Yeah, you know, it happens sometimes that a restaurant will move into a building and put in some some gas, uh, some gas ranges or something to that effect. Um, you know, that's something potentially that would be looked at down the line with an existing building code. But the idea is that would be outside of this this new code require new building code requirement. OK. And another question about attached ADUs. So I think one of the new requirements in the 
the ordinance was about um, sort of ensuring, I don't remember the exact wording, but um, it was about ensuring in the planning stages that there'd be effectively space for things like um, like a heat pump uh, duct work or something like that, that would not apply to like an attached ADU? Um, I think, I'm not sure exactly which part you're referring to, but it might be that if we're exempting attached ADUs, that any of those all electric requirements um, wouldn't apply. However, just in general, any time that um, any new building is, in, is installing gas appliances, the state building code and us would be requiring electric readiness. So they'd be prepared for electric appliances later on. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I think so. Um, yeah, overall, I guess I'm a fan of the ordinance. I'm a little concerned about this tenant improvement section. It seems like kind of a big gap potentially. Um, I, I don't exactly know how that would change things. Um, I was a little surprised also about the impact analysis. Um, if I recall correctly from uh, our discussion last week, uh, the CO2 in Albany is something around 50,000 metric tons per year. And we're we're talking about this ordinance saving on the order of like five or 10 metric tons of CO2 per year. Is that, is that about right? Yeah. I mean, you know, it depends on, it'll, it'll grow over time, especially if there's larger multifamilies. Um, but generally it is smaller. We don't have a huge amount of new construction in Albany. Um, so I think, you know, in terms of major large scale impacts, this isn't, the place to be looking. Um, it's more about setting groundwork, I think, for, for future electrification projects and, and just prevention of, you know, it's 15 tons every single year for the next 30 years or something. I think, you know, that's the idea more so. Um, but no, it's not, it's not going to take a huge chunk out of our overall greenhouse gas emissions. Especially because the new buildings are already so energy efficient. Any other comments on this item? Great, well, thank you guys. It's really helpful. I'll, uh... I'll keep working on it and take in everything that you said tonight. Thank you. Uh, can we have a quick discussion? I, I think we had brought up in a couple of these previous ones um, talking about exemptions for, um, I guess, uh, in the slides you presented, it was sort of on different types of buildings. So um, I guess specifically the ones we talked about tonight were like restaurants and um, labs. Uh, the staff proposal was basically just to include labs as exemptions in the ordinance. Is that correct? Yeah, that's right. Okay. Does anyone want to add restaurants back to the ordinance? No, but uh, I mean, to, 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 I mean, most restaurants are usually tenant improvements in Albany. So are we in, in your clarifications to Member Chen, is if a restaurant came along, let's say, you know, a restaurant left, another one comes in and they want to increase, let's say it had a gas thing and they're redoing the kitchen, they want to add two deep fryers and they want it all gas fired. Is are they exempt from that or do they have to start looking at electrical appliances? Yeah, that would be exempt under this one. Um, I'm happy to look into to what tenant improvement was, improvements we have and, and think about that. Um, I think generally speaking, that's not particularly different from someone remodeling their house and putting in a new gas stove. Um, and so it's, it sort of falls outside of the scope of a new building ordinance. It's could sort of we, existing. 
could we, well, I guess every tenant space has, has a certain level of gas service to it, or maybe not. So if a tenant came in and was a restaurant and it was a space that didn't have gas and they wanted to put gas in, would they be allowed to do that? Yeah, they would be allowed to do that under this ordinance. Okay. I'm, How... I'm pretty skeptical that that is ever the case. I think most of our buildings do already have gas service, but I'm happy to look into it in our records. Yeah, I would I would want at least to cover some of this. I, I would want something that would at least say you could not increase, you cannot add or increase the size of gas service in a tenant space. Okay, yeah, I'm happy to look into that. Yeah, okay, thanks. Good point, Daniel. Any other comments? Thoughts? Okay, thank you guys. Okay, if there's nothing else, um, I think we can move on um, to item 6 2, which is the local hazard mitigation plan update. All right, thank you, Chair Fasoon. Um, I will be presenting a brief slide deck um, and for committee member Peterson, this will be very similar to what you've seen before at the community emergency response team meeting. Um, Johnny can't be with us this evening, uh, but I will be presenting on behalf of the both of us as we've both been working on this project the last few months. I want to thank Johnny for his help developing the slides. So based on Climate Action Committee feedback, internal city staff feedback, and building off the success of the previous plan, you'll see that the new uh, proposed hazards for the plan update are highlighted in green on this screen. And for those who cannot see the screen, that is adding water shortage to water system failure under infrastructure failure. Uh, this is in response to California's historic drought. We're also adding information on public safety power shutoffs, hazardous air quality events under the wildfire primary hazard section, lessons learned from the COVID-19 pandemic under the public health epidemic section. And we're also planning to add a chapter about equity and hazard mitigation planning uh, because the previous plan did not have a dedicated section to equity. So since the Climate Action Committee last received an update from staff in February on the local hazard mitigation plan, we have reached out to all city departments to discuss the updated hazard identification and mitigation. We've had internal city meetings with information technology and communications, uh, the police department, fire department, and public works department. And we have planned meeting with recreation and community services and human services, human uh, resources and the public information officer. And then although we are in community development, we plan to do some further engagement within the community development department um, of those staff that are not on the call this evening. And we're also planning to do some coordination with the county department of public health, particularly related to hazardous air quality. As far as external community engagement goes, in February 22, 2022, uh, we presented our plan for the plan update to the Climate Action Committee, and we received your feedback on suggested updates and hazards to be included in the plan update. Just uh, this week, we did a presentation to the Albany Community Emergency Response Team. Uh, and received feedback from them that we plan to weave into the plan. It has not been included yet. Then this evening, we're returning to the Climate Action Committee with a progress update and request for additional feedback. And then in June or July, we'll plan to bring a comprehensive draft plan to the Climate Action Committee. Equity and local hazard mitigation planning. This is something that the committee hasn't talked about yet, so I'll do a brief overview of this slide, although it should look familiar as a lot of the equity issues we address in climate action and adaptation planning also affect equity in local hazard mitigation planning. Equity is a crucial component of hazard mitigation uh, because those most at risk and vulnerable members are, of our community are often those hit hardest by disasters 
and also those who oftentimes have the hardest time preparing for disasters because they're often trying to make ends meet and either don't have the um, financial means or the time to stockpile resources or prepare for disaster. There also may be lacks, lack of access to information or barriers to receiving that information. For example, if um, someone speaks a non is a non-primary English speaking community member. Opportunities to address equity in the plan update. Um, we are hoping that uh, because our last plan didn't talk about equity much, we're planning to weave that into all our sections this go around. We would also like a clear understanding of how at-risk groups may be affected by the hazards, which allows for the city to fairly allocate resources before, during, and after a disaster. Although I'll note that this plan primarily focuses on pre-disaster planning. This is not a plan that addresses post-disaster uh, actions. And we'd also like to ensure that mitigation activities do not negatively impact vulnerable populations. Similar to our climate action and adaptation planning work, we want to make sure that we're not harming those um, in our efforts to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and adapt to climate change. So for this plan, we'd like to ensure that any actions we take to mitigate disasters don't negatively impact vulnerable populations. So what we'd like to receive from the Climate Action Committee tonight is the discussion um, of equity and local hazard mitigation planning. It would be helpful for us with your uh, unique knowledge of the Albany community to provide identification of disproportionate burdens that those in our community may face that we should take into account as we develop the plan. Um, communities we should think about that we haven't previously mentioned in the plan. And also if you have any suggestions for equity focused mitigation actions to include in the plan. And then we'd also like feedback on mitigation actions to consider for the identified hazards that we showed on the last screen. And that's also included in the memo. So with that, I will stop sharing my screen and open it up for committee questions. Any questions from the committee? Committee member Peterson. Yeah, so I think we've run into this before. As far as city demographics, um, you know, as a community member, I have kind of a unscientific kind of knowledge of potentially where disadvantaged community members may be. And I don't think it's anything that I would have the city rely on as far as being the appropriate way to, to establish equity. Um, but I'm, I'm just wondering what kind of data collection the city has or has access to other than just um, census information uh, that would, and, and this, this has come up, you know, I'm doing work with the Albany uh, Community Emergency Response Team group and, you know, trying to reach out and hit these communities is real, is difficult. I mean, I know we have areas where there's moderate priced rental housing or what used to be moderately priced, I don't know in current climate, but you know, sort of older um, and doing meals on wheels delivery, I've done that. But I, does the city track any of that or do we know any, is there any data on that? Um, I, I don't think we as just random community members can, I would hope we wouldn't be the source of that data <laughs> or the only source. No, I think we primarily rely on census data or um, data from the state on um, like Calenviro screen data. But beyond that, I don't think we have any hyper specific data on um, our community and various overlays of what we might be looking for. Yeah, well, just to follow on that, I know the fire department went through this process of allowing people to self-identify as needing special needs. And that's more, I think, mobility and, and health and age may be related, but it could have a corollary with 
I mean, I mean that actually those people are in the in the course of an emergency probably the most critical ones to assess and, and make sure are being taken care of. Mm -hmm. Is it is it possible to connect with the fire department and see if if at least communications out to those people could be provided to offer assistance or something like that? That, that, that would be something I would suggest. Yeah, I can connect with fire to see what opportunities are there. I, I guess that's just really my main question is it, it is, you know, I always feel a bit awkward being the position of where staff is asking us to provide some information. And it's like, well, we're not the authorities on that. So um, it's, it's sort of hard for us to do. But anyway, thank you. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Okay, Chair Fasoon, would you like to open it up to public comment? Yeah, let's go ahead and open it to public comment. Yeah, I see a hand raise. Great, and if any other members of the public would like to speak to this item, please raise your hand. Okay, um, I don't wanna mispronounce the first name, so I'm just gonna say the last name, Matson. Hi, yes, that's fine. Um, I just uh, joined the meeting, so, but it sounds like you might not, you just said something that indicated you might not have covered it. I'm interested in finding out what post-disaster plans are in place and how, how can the public access these plans? Thank you. I can quickly answer that. Um, we have a emergency operations plan that um, identifies how the city will respond after a disaster occurs. I'm not sure if that's, I'm assuming it's publicly available, but I'm not sure. I mean, that's the only plan I know of off the top of my head. Um, Committee Member Peterson, is that responding to this comment specifically? Okay, you can quickly respond and then we'll go back to public comment. Yeah, I think you can get to that. I, I would suggest looking at the emergency response page that's under the fire department and they have some links there. Great, thank you. If any other members of the public would like to speak on this item, please raise your hand using the raise your hand feature on Zoom. Seeing none, back to you, Chair Fasoon. So let's move on to discussion. Or, yeah. Okay. Do any members of the committee have feedback on this item? Yeah, Committee Member Peterson. Yeah, I guess maybe this is more another question. Uh, you know, since I'm involved in a volunteer group and there is this community emergency response teams, which is all volunteer, is there coordination in this plan with that group and in um, how it will be um, communicated with or at least empowered to help us? Uh, um, neighborhood level during incidents. Is that covered in this? Sorry that I didn't read it in detail, but I wasn't sure if there's reference to volunteer um, uh, input. I think the last version of the plan referenced the um, community emergency response team and working with CERT to reach the community. And I imagine that this plan will have a similar action or two. This plan is primarily for city departments as they plan for mitigation of disaster within internal city structures, rather than, which I think would include working with CERT. But I'll say, I don't think this plan would identify any specific actions for CERT to do because it's not really our role 
to direct a volunteer group. But the quick answer to your question is yes, this plan will reference working with CERT to achieve some of the objectives of the plan. It just won't identify specific actions, most likely. Yes, as I kind of follow on that, there in in under the equity tag on that, because I, I participate in that group, we have had a heck of a time, especially trying to get, say, apartment building dwellers to participate. I mean, the single family homeowners all seem to be the more interested and active members of CERT. Mm -hmm. And if there's a methodology that maybe the city wants to introduce or, and, and again, my group will be, or the group, the volunteer group I belong to will be working with the fire department to sort of look into this. But, you know, they have this idea of um, block captains for home household neighborhoods, right? Where there are houses, you have a block captain. But it's sort of hard to do that when you have, say, Kane Street in a neighborhood of apartment buildings. And what makes more sense is to have almost like an apartment captain and the apartment captain should actually have information that is then, if they leave, handed over to the building manager so that it remains consistent. Or you'll just constantly lose it as transient housing goes on to somebody else. So there's a, you know, the equity issue, I think, is really strong amongst our multiple family housing occupants. And I would encourage you to talk with or, or do put forward this concern. Um, I don't know if it's really a climate action issue, but in trying to get people to respond to climate action issues, going through emergency response is sometimes a good way to get the information out. And we, we haven't been very effective reaching multifamily housing occupants. Mm -hmm. So if, if there's something there that can be brought to play, that would be helpful. Great, thank you. Uh, one comment. Um, I'm not sure if this is entirely appropriate for uh, the, the um, hazard mitigation plan, but just sort of overall, um, I found it a little bit difficult to tie kind of the information in the hazard mitigation plan with sort of the city's overall general land use and planning um, process. So for example, like I think in the local mitigation um, hazard plan for a lot of different scenarios, it talked about um, sort of strengthening existing buildings or, or um, working with soft story ordinances um, and, and things of that nature. Uh, but I didn't get the sense of like, um, just at a very broad level, like, are we, are we spending a lot of time thinking about how to improve um, certain areas of Albany for having greater business rather than, you know, improving areas to um, deal with emergencies. So I don't know exactly how to frame this point, but um, like, I think it is an important equity issue to just sort of connect not only like our hazard mitigation plan with vulnerable populations, but also sort of tie that in with um, overall city planning. And if there's any way to connect that with the hazard mitigation plan, I think that would be pretty beneficial. Great suggestion. Um, and this actually might be a great opportunity for Michelle to provide an update on soft story ordinance, which was referenced in the previous plan. We are working on it. It is, it is getting close. <laughs> um, Hopefully we'll have a soft story ordinance sometime this fall. And then we'll, uh, we'll get the soft story buildings working on um, getting retrofitted in the next few years. Committee member Peterson. That, that, that brings another um, issue into play was just, uh, interfacing with, and, and I think there's a reference to, as part of uh, at least the community out there and, and preparation, the, um, the schools, the schools. And I know the community itself really sees schools as resources, not only for child education, but potentially for um, 
post-disaster support. And I don't know if there's any work being done at, within this hazard mitigation plan to coordinate with the uh, school district on that. I don't believe so because it's, this plan is dictating the actions of the entity we have jurisdiction over. So all we can include is encourage the district to do X, but we can't make any actions that we can't tell them to do anything. So this is uh, more. I, I guess what I was thinking of is rather than just putting statements in, in the, this mitigation plan that said, you know, we were directing, I'm not saying that you should direct that, but could you reach out and do a memorandum of understanding or something like that to establish community resilience um, centers or something like that? I can ask, um, I'm not sure, but I can look into it. I think that might go, that might be helpful for, um, you know, people more at risk that maybe don't have resources in their home, they could have a place to go where, you know, they could bide some time and then um, get back in their home when it's safe to do so. Right. And I think this is another tricky spot where we can, the local hazard mitigation plan is for pre-disaster planning. So the plan would address setting those or potentially setting those up, but it wouldn't dictate how they're run after the fact. But yeah, I, I can look into this. Thank you. Any other comments from the committee? Okay, thank you for your feedback. Okay, if no one else has anything to add, um, I think we can move on. Um, let's go on to item 6-3, which is the Home Electrification Mandate Subcommittee presentation. Okay, so that's me. And I do have a slide I can share. So just so you know, let's see, where am I at with my power? I've got 32 minutes left. If uh, I don't think it'll take that long, but if I um, lose my computer, I'm going to come back on phone. And I, Lizzie, I sent you and Michelle a PDF of, of my slides. So I'll, um, I'm going to try sharing my screen here. Uh, that's it. Share. Uh, it's always slows down when I'm sharing my screen. Okay, so hopefully in a couple seconds, you'll see my screen. Everybody see that? Yes. Okay, good. So this is, a, um, you know, this started out as point of sale POS electrification subcommittee. So we were looking at, and I think this is actually, you know, this was a good segue from the, the question Daniel asked about like, gee, we put remodelings and new buildings and we only reduce the emissions by a few uh, hundred tons per year. Yeah, that's because it's all existing housing that's pumping this stuff out. So what do we do with the existing housing? So that's the whole idea here. And what we've, we've eventually from, you know, we did some outreach to the uh, real estate folks in Albany got only minimal response from that. Mostly were ignored. And, uh, but one person was rather very interested and very motivated to encourage us to come up with some sort of mandate so that at least something happens when a home changes hands. And one of the thoughts I had about that is this could lead later to uh, some sort of requirements. At some point, I think we'll have just like with soft story, you just can't continue to pollute. You're gonna to have to start having a plan to do something. And this would be um, a precedent 
for for doing that because these are existing homes that are going up for sale and we're just capturing them then rather than just telling people you got to do it anyway so just to recap efforts to date we um you know this is myself and um member mira venkatesh uh, we did a little bit of outreach to the community and i said there were very few responses we did receive from candace Hyde wang uh, pre, um, input, which she was at our last April meeting and recommending a mandate to do some sort of any sort of upgrade. She was recommending panel upgrades. Um, so sort of the takeaway is that we think there's an opportunity uh, to to bring this forward. It would be initially unpopular, especially with uh, there's um, from our understanding, there's sort of a standing um, anti-mandate stance that most of the uh, folks in the real estate industry take just because it it makes life more complicated makes it more difficult for sellers uh, it's just more hurdles to get through and it, you know the whole process of, of selling and buying property is pretty fraught anyway um, for those of us who have gone through it it's the paperwork is unrelenting um, but anyway uh, once it becomes established uh, what Ken was saying, you know, real estate agents do whatever they're called on to do. They just do it. You know, if, you know that happened with the uh, sewer lateral requirements. You know that, that all just gets taken care of, and and they'll they'll just do it. But it's getting it in place. So we want to be thoughtful about how what we put forward. And so what we've crafted now is a proposed, and and per Ken's recommendation, more a point of listing rather than sale, because you want people to think about this when they list the property, not when it goes through escrow. By the time it hits escrow, it's too late. So it's a point of listing. And what I've called an energy efficiency and electrification or a 3E incentive program. I like the idea of calling it incentive because what this really does is incentivizes people to make these changes um, or you know, there could be cost implications. So this is during the whole sales process and that will improve the energy efficiency while also bringing them closer to being fully electric. Um, so the feature of the program is simple and easy. The rating system uh, is accomplished by just doing standard building inspections that already happen now. I mean, every building that goes for sale, they, they usually have a, a building inspector come through and sort of assess, you know, is the panel one of the type of panels that is old? How big is it? You know, what state as a chimney in, what is the roof like, you know, what are the windows like? Of course, there's always the pest report where they determine as best as possible if there's anything that's um, rotting, deteriorating, dry rot, that kind of stuff. Um, that's just accepted industry standard. So the rating system would be based on just what is normal sort of inspection. Um, it's scalable. It can, it, the idea is it would start at kind of a a minimal level or, or, you know, it can be adjusted. You know, some people might think something's minimal, other might think it could be higher. And it's based on listed price and increase over time as needed. Or it can even, you can even have higher levels of performance could be phased in. Um, so we wanted to have it scalable. It's flexible, prioritizes the most attainable conversions first, or it sort of incentivizes, maybe that's the better way to say it, more attainable con and who pays and which upgrades are done, you know, are really negotiated between the buyer and the seller. So we're not telling them what to do. It's just like you need this needs to happen because you're selling the home. It's been evaluated per this formula. This amount of work has to be done to improve the performance. You guys work it out. It can all be the buyer. It can all be the seller. It can be a split between them, but we're not telling. It's, it's not mandating that. That's really up you know, to be worked out with your real estate agent, the buyer and the seller. So I think that gives a lot of flexibility. It's performance-based, uh, minimum expenditure is based on list price and building performance. So the two kind of go together. And then, uh, you know, if you have a poor performing building, you're going to have to spend more. Um, and there, there are some other things that come into play with that when you think about really poor performing buildings. Um, so it incentivizes key players. So the industry professionals are motivated to do improvement that lower mandatory expenses. 
So I'm sure some of some people will say, well, we know how the scoring system goes. So do these and, and we can lower what you need to do. But already that motivates them to do the right thing rather than just a lot of cosmetic upgrades and fancy staging of the house, which really do nothing to improve the efficiency or the electrification. So the features of the point of listing 3E program is just use a standard inspection criteria performed by qualified persons. There's a, you know, they always get a, a certified building inspector. And uh, electrification is um, just establishing what the service is to the home, which is easy. And then saying what the appliances are, which is easy also. So energy efficiency is based on insulation, attic, roof, wall, and floor. And the only one there that might be a little tricky to do is wall, and, but there are ways to do it. And then weather stripping and window type. So really kind of um, tightness and performance of the envelope. And then under electrification, it's just what's your water heating system, what's your stove range, what's your clothes dryer, do you have any EV charging capability, even if it's a 110 outlet in the garage? Um, space conditioning, and then your main electrical panel conditioning capacity, which are all very straightforward things to determine. So here's what here's what how the system would work. So the scoring system is very simple: no points, one point, two points. And you know, attic insulation either there's nothing, you don't get anything. And this is sort of based, these numbers might need to be tweaked up or down. You go back and check. I think what would be a good point is just standard, you know, kind of this R18, I think, which is about six inches of insulation. So either you got it or you don't. If you have something less, you get one point. If you got it, you get the two points. And then with the um, windows, um, if you have single glazed, you don't get any points. There's some older aluminum dual glazed and tilt pack type windows that have been done. Old meaning we would have to establish what that means, you know, 10 years or more, or if it's 10 years or less and new dual throughout, then you get the two points. And then wall insulation. The, the idea with having a minimum of half of the walls, exterior walls, or half of the, the floor, or half of the openings weather stripped. The idea being that there could be an addition that was done uh, more recently and performs better. And then the old house is still, a, you know, the old remaining portions are old. I've seen a lot of that. So that's kind of the idea there um, at one point. But if everything's all, you know, more up to par, you get the better points. Same thing with um, evaluation of the Appliances, it's just if you're gas, you don't get any points. If you don't have an EV charge, you get nothing. And if you're less than a 100 amp panel, you get nothing. And then there's certain electric resistance type um, systems that may be in existence. It's not saying that we advocate them, but at least you, you know, at least they're not gas. So these get you one point. If you have a level one, meaning a 110 outlet in your garage or an exterior one near where you park your car, you get a point. And then uh, if you have at least 100 amp, it should be a 100 amp panel or a little better, you get a point. And then the two points is, you know, you've got everything. You know, it's all good stuff. So this is where the incentives come in to increase the points. Well, how do the points work? Well, here's, here, I, I first I, I thought of this and ran an example of what would have, what, the, what this could look like. And then just th this part of the chart is just saying, well, let's look at a worst case, let's look at a perfect and everything in between. And so what this works in tandem with is the scoring we just looked at. And what I've got in this example is I took a house that had five inches or, you know, there's gotta be a bare minimum, um, but, you know, at least five inches of insulation. If it has more, it would have been two. Um, and it didn't, it had single pane windows, it had, only partial wall insulation, only partial floor insulation, and no weather stripping. So it gets a score of three for energy efficiency. Then with it, did, it didn't have everything's gas, except there is a 110 outlet in the garage, and its panel is, is 100 amps. So it got two. Add those together, divide by two. The average between these, you get 2.5. So that's a, not a very good performing home. 
you go over here, this tells you required amount of listed value to be expended on uh, E3E upgrades. So the list value for was going to be one and a half million. I mean, a home in this state at one and a half million is kind of ridiculous. But anyway, if you were going to do that, that means you, since it's 2.5, it's between, it's greater than two, less than four, 1.25%. So here's another place where you have some flexibility to change these numbers and tweak this so it seems reasonable. So what we're saying here is if you're going to sell that home for 101.5 mil, you need to, at the point of listing, put in $18,750 worth of upgrades to move it to at least, you know, here, if you look at what they potentially could do with that, including a 200 amp panel install, which you could do, you know, they could get it up to an 8.5. So it's improved. It's a much better home, but they had to have spent that. And that's just only one and one and a quarter percent of the listed value. And then it's up to the, the agents to determine who pays for it, how they pay for it, whether it's just, you know, if you, you know, the buyer has to, pay 1.518750 you know and and it's all done anyway that's that's we're not saying it we just say that has to happen so what you start to see here is there there's an incentive here where people are going gee i don't want to spend lots of money can i get my house to good what do i need to do and they'll start comparing if they have sort of a bad home they'll start comparing go well i you know I, I think I can just lump this in, get this buyer to accept it. So it gives them a lot of flexibility on how they um, look at this and they know about it ahead of fact. And in fact, if you're thinking of selling your home in a couple of years, you can go, well, I'm, you know, I don't want to be stuck with all these. So I'll start prioritizing some of these improvements so that when it comes time to sell, I'm up here, you know, at a best. So you can see this, this diminishes to where you get greater than nine and or equal to 11 all these on this side should be an equal to so it's here it's greater than four um, less than or equal to seven so i mean there are little things you could tweak with this obviously people are going to try to game the system just barely make four so that they fall into um you know a certain range and not and then save you know but I like that aspect because it, you know, real estate agents are very smart people and they, they're connected to people who do improvements. And so these improvements, it's just incentivizing across the whole process um, to make people do this. So we recommend, I think at this point, it'd be nice to get a staff evaluation of this. Um, I'm, you know, this isn't telling staff to do anything. I'm just curious, and I would love staff input on what our next step would be. It, um, but I, I'd like to request that staff determines, you know, let us know what is the process for and the next steps to move this, um, what I call the 3E uh, point of listing upgrade program forward or incentive program forward. Um, you know, just other things that I think staff will start to look at is some of these really challenged, poor performing homes. A lot of times people just want to sell a home in Albany as is. And uh, you know, I did that with my mom's own home, and you know, there could be a certain grace period where the new buyer has a certain period of time to file a permit for a major remodeling, and they, all they have to do is show that they're spending at least the amount that was uh, indicated in the sale uh, on energy efficiency and whatever upgrades. And if they do a fully electric, well insulated home. You know they're going to spend way more than that doing that anyway so um it, it isn't even a burden in that case and they get you know two years is an adequate amount of time to do that and then if the sales the other thing is well someone will just list something really low and then sell it for really high um well if the sales you, know, you could have things that said if the sales price is 25 percent or more over list price then the required 3e upgrades amount will be based on 90 percent of the sales price, not the list price. So that kind of, you know, they're all, there are just a lot of opportunities to make this flexible and work well. And I think we could bring it into place. And I think once it's established and people understand it's straightforward and they're just going to have to do it, 
um, we could capture, you know, if 100 homes are selling in Albany over a year, I mean, that's a lot better than just even the, the, uh, the, the work we've just doing with the elect, the um, no gas uh, imposition. And then later, um, this could become a model for actual uh, phased in building performance requirements, which, and Lizzie, you can correct me if I'm wrong, and maybe you don't recall this, but I think when Berkeley originally started doing their RICO and then Vito, the idea was they wanted to bring all existing, you know, we've got these existing homes that are the lion's share of what's emitting, um, you know, it isn't new homes and everybody isn't going to remodel their home. So at some point, you're going to have to make people improve their homes so they're not polluting anymore. Otherwise, it'll just go on forever. Um, but anyway, this sets a precedent and establishes a methodology. So th that, that's another benefit on it. So I'll just leave this up, probably at this. And uh, uh, I'll take any questions if anybody has any. Any questions from the committee? Uh, I have one question. Uh, Nick, I'm kind of curious. Um, there's a lot of elements of the proposal that sound very, very similar to the BESO program in Berkeley. Um, is there a way that, uh, like, has the subcommittee looked into reaching out to anyone who's worked on BESO or might just have more um, context on how that pro program has performed. I think it's it started around 2014 or something. So um, there's yeah, no, like there's six years. Of, no, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, um, you know, we started our, we, we tried to do it, we called it BEDO, Building Energy Disclosure, Building Energy Disclosure and Ordinance or something, BEA, Building Energy Assessment and Disclosure Ordinance. And the problem with the, is that it's based on doing an energy score sort of measurement, and it isn't really based on doing electrification. So, it, you know, and they, and they also got beaten down by, um, you know, the real estate industry to where it changed from really having some teeth and requiring that stuff being done to where you could just pass it all on to, to the buyer. Um, you could you could you could not you pay a certain amount and not do it and then the buyer would have to take on the responsibility so it was all watered down and and wasn't um you know it was bringing about a certain amount of change i mean i've gotten information from someone and in fact i think um stop waste is now um assisting bayran in evaluating how these uh, you know a baso system could be rolled out into more communities, but it only, you know, there was something like it, it had like a 6% impact on improvement or something like that on homes that were sold that within a certain year, certain things did happen because people were more aware of what they, sh they should do. This would have, a, I mean, this you're really requiring. And, and the other thing was that the earlier, I think it was the RICO program only required something like $7,500 of expenditure, and it was just fought tooth and nail. So here, you know, we're, we're asking for some, I mean, if something's really a lousy performer, you have to do some significant improvements before you can sell it. And we're, the idea is that people take this seriously, and the money, you know, a lot of money exchanges hands when homes are sold. But if, you know, luckily, we have some people they'll they'll buy very poor performing home. And when, when they get in it and then in the next couple of years, they remodel it. So if they're gonna do that anyway, it, it doesn't really impact them because they're gonna spend this money anyway. But for those that just sort of roll it over and nothing happens and they walk away from the whole thing, taking big profits and leaving Albany, but leaving Albany with a poor performing building, it's trying to influence that a little bit more strongly. I guess, you know, to answer your question, I don't remember specifics on it, but we have looked at Berkeley's program quite a bit. The first issue is it's very um, administrative heavy. 
uh, it takes a lot of staff time. Our staff has already said they don't want to take something like that on. Um, it's it seems very kind of bureaucratic. Um, it it doesn't. It's based on a system that doesn't prioritize electrification, um, and it doesn't seem to lead to significant uh, improvements. So, you know, at one point we thought we could just totally adopt that program, but again, the, all those hurdles. Um, plus, we had real estate community people telling the city council they shouldn't do it. So, but we're we're a few years past that now. I don't know if I really answered your question very well. What are, I'm kind of curious if, do people kind of get how this works or did it seem a little complicated? The basis of it is really just this rating system and this, this um, fee uh, determination. And everything else here is just examples, you know, just showing here's something, here's how it could have an impact. I, I didn't break this down to actual costs, sort of ballparked in my head, you know, hey, I think they could achieve this with that amount of money. Um, of course, it's all very specific to the condition of the building, but, you know, it, it just shows you that if, you know, it's, it's a motivator to get to selling a home that's like this, because then, you know, you have very minimal. I mean, everybody goes in, you go into a homes these days, and if you see a pest report for $50,000, that's, you know, that's not the end of the world. Um, everybody kind of knows that. I mean, totally 100% clean pest reports mean that that's a pretty pristine, well-performing building. So it's probably somewhere in this range anyway, but this, this just in the same way that people may take care of pest report problems so that they can ask more for their home, you would take care of energy and electrification performance problems so that you could potentially get more. And I, we've even heard, um, Candace was even telling us some of these, uh, you know, some improvements will actually be um, money makers. I mean, you'll spend a certain amount of money, but you'll get it back and more at the sale. So even before, you know, if, if you take this and you say, well, before I list, I'm gonna look at, I'm gonna work out on my own what, what I think I need to spend to get, get from say a bad to a good or even a best. And you may find that you can do it for less than 18,000, you might do it for 9,000, but, it, but it's a motivator, right? Um, Everybody's going to be wanting to be in here because then you don't have to pay anything. That's the whole idea of an incentive. If there's no comments, oh, Eric. I wasn't quite clear. Are we still in questions or are we in discussion? Questions. Okay. Got a question? No. Oh. Okay. Doesn't look like we have any more questions. How about comments? Um, Chair Fasoon, do you want to open it up to public comment? Yeah, let's go ahead and do that. Okay. I see we have one member of the public. Um, Committee Member Peterson, you may have to. Oh, there we go. Perfect. Okay. I just knocked him off. Jeremiah? <laughs> Hi, everybody. Good to see you. Um, so my biggest uh, question is I'm going to be talking about the windows. Uh, recently, my dad bought another house and just finished remodeling the back house and remodeling the downstairs in the front house. Um, it's really tough to convince my dad to install the new double pane windows with the white plastic trim. Um, the windows on there now are the old aluminum single pane. And I, I've recently convinced my dad to upgrade all of the windows to double pane white plastic. Um, as long as I did them myself, <laughs> I said no problem. So I only have one more window to go and it's almost done. Um, I'm actually a professional glazer 
I do weather construction. Back in the day, I did all the windows over at Cloud Hall in you know, San Francisco Junior College. But anyway, I'm really big on these windows because number one, the windows are more efficient, energy efficient. It keeps the house warm when it's supposed to stay warm and cool when it's hotter outside. And they look so nice. <laughs> I mean, these white plastic windows, the double pane, it's pretty much a standard nowadays. And they just make the house look and feel like a million bucks. And all you gotta do is change the windows. So I just wanna give a shout out to, you know, if everybody could do the windows and upgrade from the single pane aluminum frames to double pane white plastic. And now my question is, are there any incentives in Albany for homeowners um, or even tenants that are stuck with these single pane windows? And every winter they have mold and mildew issues and condensation gathering on their windowsills and mold starts going behind the bed frames and around the windows. So for health purposes and energy efficient purposes, I would really like all a program to help cover some of the costs of either the parts for the new windows and I'm not sure the labor, but at least if Albany can come up with uh, some sort of parts to help pay for the new windows, I think it's a great program. Thank you. Recording in progress. Okay. Um, and Jeremiah, just so you know, for the future, um, you are breaking up a bit. We can hear probably 90% of what you're saying, but it's a little bit muffled every now and then. Just a heads up. Also, just quickly to note that Bayren does have some, um, some rebates for windows and other insulation type projects. Thank you, Michelle. Now for Lucinda Young. Hi, um, thank you, um, Committee Leader Peterson. Um, I, um, I mean, I think we we got to come up with some way to reach these highly polluting houses um, that are in inventory, and it seems like focusing on point of sale is makes the most sense. I know we've got you know, various rebates out there to encourage this and there's some minor tax credits, but it's just not enough. So I like the idea of focusing on point of sale. Um, I'm wondering, um, I know um, there's discussion about Berkeley had, I mean, nothing like, or, or something somewhat similar, but there's not the focus on electrification. I'm just wondering if there are any other cities out there that have done anything like this that might, um, we may be able to look to to uh, get some help in crafting um, this kind of requirement. Um, one question I did have is I didn't see anything in the rating system for rooftop solar. If a home has rooftop solar and it seems like that ought to uh, fat, be a factor that's taken into consideration in rating the home. Uh, but I, um, I know there's a lot here but I like the overall idea. Seems like there's some, uh, I'm wondering how it works with you know, how much time would say a buyer have to make these. And I know that all has to be worked out, but um, we do need some way to uh, reach this inventory. And it seems like point of sale when there's so much money changing hands and so many um, improvements being made to a home that this would, it would make sense to, um, to focus on this. Thank you. Great. Uh, David Wimmer. Hi. Um, yeah, thank you, Member uh, Peterson. This is <clears throat> a really, really good inform uh, you know, uh, information you put together. I really agree with the approach. A um, couple of comments is that <clears throat> on the um, some of the, uh, the measures to be taken, 
um, you, you kind of have, you give them the same weight um, as far as energy savings, like, you know, uh, you could insulate your floor and you can get two points or you can change out your windows and you get two points. So I'm just wondering if, you know, we maybe we should refine the, the, um, the ratings so, you know, um, that, so it's really more reflects the energy savings that you're going to get from that particular measure. And maybe, you know, and so like, uh, you know, weather stripping. So, you know, you know maybe weather stripping <clears throat> is, you know, give you enough, um, give you the same amount of energy savings as, you know, swapping out double pane windows. Well, that's, that's great. You know, so somebody, you know, can do it for, you know, 10 cents on the dollar to weather strip. Um, so I just, you know, maybe, maybe fine tune some of those. Otherwise we're going to end up with, you know, people are going to take the cheapest way to, to get their points. And, and, and maybe that may not give us the, uh, the savings that we're, we're hoping for um, compared to some of the other measures. Um, you know, I like the idea of uh, including uh, uh, installation of new solar. You know, uh, if that's <clears throat> going to be like even the best um, you know, way to um, you know go go uh, electrification, you know, maybe we should you know give bonus points for that, um, and to in to incentivize that. And then the other one was the uh, upgrading the electrical panel. I mean that that per se doesn't save energy. To um, the other measures that rely upon upgrading the um, panel save energy. So um, um, maybe I'm not quite on board with having that as an item. Um, and I think that's it, but uh, thanks. This is a uh, really good stuff. I think we're going, that takes us in the right direction. Great. If any of other members of the public would like to speak to this item, please raise your hand. I don't see any other members of the public with their hand raised. Back to you, Chair Fassoon, to open it up to discussion. Yeah, let's go right along to discussion. If you don't mind, I'll kick it off, Committee Member Peterson, by responding to your uh, request that staff review this proposal. I think Michelle and I, um, we've heard the presentations, but we have additional staff we'll need to run this by um, so we can do that and provide an update in the next few weeks. Great, thank you. Chair you know, maybe, oh, well, before, before we take some other, I wanted to respond to some of the comments that um, were made by public. First of all, yes, Windows. I, I, I like the idea, maybe the score system um, looks a little bit at, uh, you know, bang for buck that you get by doing certain things to incentivize the right things. So, the, you know, the, again, it, right now the proposal just aired on super simplicity. We just want people to do whatever and, and letting them sort of go for what's going to be most feasible. Every home is kind of different. Um, every situation is different. We didn't want to second guess things. Um, the, uh, the idea of the panel is that a, a lot of uh, homes can't be electrified because they have such crappy panels. So I wanted to rate that. If you had a crappy panel, you got a crappy score and everything sort of pivots around the panel. In fact, the person we talked to in, in the real estate industry was recommending that if you do anything, just make them put in a 200 amp panel, period, nothing else. And in my mind, that's kind of like, eh, you know, that's a little bit of a blunt instrument. Um, hey, honey, our house is a piece of crap, but at least it has a 200 amp panel. Uh, I don't know if that really works. So again, it's in there. And, and what it means is if, if you want to put some of those more electrical load intensive devices in and you upgrade your panel, you get some credit for it. So I wanted people to be able to get credit for that if they did it and not just completely leave it out of the picture. But I like the idea of maybe, maybe adjusting some of the scoring uh, to make some things, especially the window. Windows I see as a big hurdle, windows and wall insulation. Those are very um, costly. 
um, but are are very well worth doing. So maybe we, they they get a bit they get a better point structure for that. Again, this shows the flexibility of this system. It can be tweaked and manipulated and made to to be um, better. I see Eric has his hand up. Kira Fasun, would you like to call on people or would you like me to? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, community member Larson, sorry, if my dog, if you see him clawing, <laughs> trying to play. <laughs> Thanks. Hey, um, Nick and Mira Venkatesh, uh, great job on putting that together. That's really quite comprehensive work and really nicely, nicely laid out. A um, couple of thoughts, I, I guess, you know, just in terms of the very last comments there, I think that the energy efficiency like insulation and windows is so well accepted by most people as being a, a you know, there's a certain ROI for that. They can, they can easily get their head around. I install, you know, insulated windows or more insulation. I get this much energy efficiency increase. That's a, that's a direct ROI. They can do that calculation. They don't need as much incentive for that. I don't think it's the, the big, um the big move is electrification i think and, and and that's not so easily calculated people have to figure you know like natural gas versus electric and it's complicated so i think that's the push i would i would prefer to see this the rating skewed towards electrification and not so much on the energy efficiency i mean energy efficiency is good and we want to encourage that but i think people are are over that hump already they understand that they they you know they don't need as much incentive there they need the incentive on the electrification and so that and the panel i totally agree with you on the panel that's a huge gotcha for um people doing electrification projects and if you do it at the point of sale that's a that's a big improvement that we really should incentivize so that's so my my input would just be in terms of the point rating scale more skewed towards electrification um uh, or at least thinking about what you know the dollars and cents ROI, you know what what the information is there out, out there in the world already. Um, and to your comment about is this too complicated? I think it yes, it is too complicated when you put it out like you did. But that's okay for us because we're digging into it. You know, certainly in this age of you know calculators and you know widgets or you know whatever we can certainly simplify that and you know if you break it down into you know two things with three categories and you put the things in and you get an out, answer out at the bottom that's that's pretty easily doable I, I would want to see that as part of the project though to make sure that we make it simple for real estate agents and people doing the home sales to you know you know inputs outputs done you know easy so that's that's my feedback, but I love it, love it. Um, <laughs> when you said that you know 1.5 million house and there's 18,000, so then you go 1.5018, oh, you know it's like it, it just puts in scale how much money there is changing hands versus how much this is. You know 18,000 sounds like a lot to a lot of people, and it is. That's a lot of money, but when you put in the context of a house sale, it's just like this is absolutely the opportunity to do that so good job yeah thank you appreciate that a couple um responses back the one thing to keep in mind is that uh, you know return on investment kind of goes out the window when you're selling the home you don't care anymore because it's going to be someone else's problem so i think it's still important to incentivize uh energy efficiency it, it, to some degree, but I, I get your point. I, at first, we were thinking we wouldn't even have the energy efficiency; it would just be on electrification. And I thought, well, you'll you put them together, you make them work together, and at least everything's better, and it gives more flexibility in what people decide they want to do. Um, I think that's the whole thing. Is if if it's like, look, do this, do that. You know, you can make you know replace the windows. It's it's all straightforward. Just do it. <laughs> No. Um, so I, I and again, I think as more eyes kind of look at this and, and think about it, 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 you know, when I first started putting this together, I thought, oh, this is just a headache again. And I was thinking of, of what, you know, I kept thinking back on the house grades thing. And he said, I just made it simple. There are just five things 
do these five things and you're done. And then you have your little grade. The only problem with that is the grade doesn't really, you know, some people may, I mean, a grade is very little incentive to do something unless people really understand what the grade is, and whether they really care or all they don't care because they're just going to buy whatever they can, just get their foot into Albany. So I much prefer um, this method where you just say, you got it, you know, you're selling this. It's got to be a reasonable performer. If it isn't, you have to prove it before you sell it. And then they can, you know, they can say, well, we're not going to do it. We're going to make the buyer, but then at least the buyer's on the hook and they said they're going to do it and it has to happen. So there's some, uh, there's certainly some issues about, I was even thinking it could be, you could set up a program where the city actually provides them the score. It you know, just gives them this, this form. They fill out some information and it comes back to them saying, you're going to spend this much and, and come back when you have the receipts, you know, and, and if, uh, you know, the enforcement will be in a, you know, how do you hold people's feet to the fire? If uh, I did talk about, like, if some people say, well, we want this crappy house and we're willing to pay this much for it and we're going to remodel it. And when we remodel it, we will spend, you know, all this money of which, of course, there's that amount going into better improvements. That's fine too. I mean, some people are just not going to bat an eye at this because, you know, they already plan on pumping a million dollars into a $1.5 million house, which seems incredible, but it's, I see it happening all the time. Um, so anyway, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm glad people so far see kind of an advantage of it. I'm keeping it simple. I think it really, it really is kind of simple. Um, but you can, you can, play a little bit with some of the amounts, like the scores, you know, the, some of the scores could change a little. But then once it's set, everybody understands it, it plays out, it has built in incentives. And I think that's what we want to try to establish. So I would be interested in what the staff would find out about how you'd actually put this in place. And how, you know, how would you you know, it's like, how do they make sure that the sewer lateral is taken care of? I guess there's an inspection that happens. So how do you, how does the city ensure that this has taken place or that it fits within certain measures? I noticed with with ADUs, you have to literally get filed with your deed of ownership that you will not subdivide and sell the ADU as a separate property. So owners are you know, there's actually put stuff put in place to require that. Um, and I, I think we could certainly do that with with this. And there could, you know, could be if stuff isn't done, if money's in escrow and they don't do it, they lose the money and it goes to the city to use on climate change issues. So those are all things that I'm hoping staff can kind of come back and say, well, here are the hurdles or here, here's um, how it can be implemented or or challenges in implementing it. And we can provide that feedback, but I think, like I said, Michelle and I are gonna have to run it more beyond just the two of us. Um, yeah, absolutely. Well, I, yeah, I want you to. Um, I will note that we're at 8.54 and we have an end time of nine o'clock. So if the committee wants to continue past nine to cover any other subcommittee updates or future agenda item requests, we'll need a motion to extend. Is this our last item? We do have subcommittee updates and then future agenda items still on the agenda. I, I can, you know, speaking for the um, zero emission vehicle. And, well, we can't we can't move forward because if we're going to extend, then any update we make, we need to open it up to public comment, and we um, don't have time to accommodate that at this point. So we need to extend. To make a motion that we extend for another fifteen minutes. Yeah, I second. Okay. Uh, committee member Chen? Aye. Committee member Larson? Aye. Committee member Peterson? Aye. Chair Fassoon? Aye. Motion carries. Meeting continues to 9.15. Okay, keep going, committee member Peterson. Um, yeah, I was just going to say, I, as far as zero emission vehicle and others, uh, that one, Eric and I didn't get together to discuss anything, so I have nothing to report. And, Eric does. I don't know if the um, 
outreach committee has anything to report. Well, before we do that, have we closed item 6-3, the home electrification mandate presentation? Yeah, I'm done, although the only thing I wanted to accomplish was that this go start, keep moving forward with staff. And it sounds like you guys said you would do that. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Okay, Chair Fassoon, I think that closes item 6-3. Okay, and now, yeah, let's go back to item 6-4, which committee member Peterson, um, did we end the zero emission transportation subcommittee or did you have more to add? I, I don't have any update. Yeah. Okay, awesome. Um, do we have, does anyone have updates? Don't have any update on the um, outreach either. Same goes for me. I had a question about outreach. Are you down to just one member now? No, it's um, Chair Fassoon and myself. Oh, okay, good. But we, we should probably talk about whether we want to continue that subcommittee or not. I mean. We're missing no, I, a few members this evening. So I don't know if you want to talk about that my recommendation would be to talk about it at a future meeting yeah, and see if anyone else. It. And I know committee member Muhammad um, indicated some interest in okay. that subcommittee. So that could be something also to note. So yeah, I think it would be best if we could just um, talk about this when we have more um, folks on the call. Okay. Okay. If there are no other subcommittee updates, Chair Fasoon, I recommend you open the floor to public comment. Yeah, what any members of the public, does anyone have any questions, anything to say, comments? I don't see any members of the public with their hand raised. We'll do one final call for public comment on 6-4. Okay, back to you, Chair Fasoon. Okay, that looks like we can go on to uh, item seven, which is future agenda items. Um, so does anyone have requests for future agenda items? Uh, yeah, committee member Peterson. Yeah, so I, I think along the lines of the zero emission vehicle, um, I just want to, and I appreciated it being on for future item in, in the minutes from our last meeting, is just um, electrification of police vehicles. And I'm, I would like to send on some information and, and links to staff so we can start um, bringing that forward. I think there, there would be some really great benefits uh, to the police department and to the city in general if, if that was pursued earlier rather than later, especially not 10 years out. Um, one item I did kind of want to bring up, I don't know if there's a specific action on it, um, but I believe the CPUC is reopening M3 proceedings. Um, this is dealing with um, solar tariffs and things of that nature. Um, I believe that the comment period that of that is uh, up until July or something like that. Um, so if there is a specific recommendation that we would want the city council to make, or if there's anything that we would want to bring up with EBC, I feel like that is an item that we should prioritize in one of the next few meetings. Well, I second that because I think a statement from the city council to the CPUC is in order, especially since the comment period is only open on three very specific subjects, which show that the CPUC has not changed their um, position at all. Any other agenda requests? If not, I do see we have two members of the public with their hand raised. If you'd like to open it up to public comment, Chair Fasoon. Yeah, let's go right ahead. Jeremiah. Thank you and good evening to everybody. First off, I'd just like to say 
that Albany and staff and everybody, we are doing wonderful in our climate action and everything we're doing. And I just, I would like to see one thing, if we could focus on it a little bit, um, about our public works vehicles. If we could somehow get the diesel trucks and the big, huge V8 gas guzzlers, if we could slowly start to convert our city uh, municipal vehicles to, you know, starting out with maybe hybrid pickup trucks. I looked online, they're about twenty to thirty thousand um, dollars, and eventually be electric electric vehicles. So, future agenda item would be possible discussion on converting the public works vehicles from their diesel or V8 gas vehicles to a greener and more efficient uh, fleet. Thank you for that public comment. I'll just quickly respond uh, by noting that our fire and public works diesel powered vehicles are currently running on renewable diesel, uh, which is not, um, is not net neutral, but it is significantly greener than standard diesel. I encourage you to Google it if you'd like. Uh, now on to Lucinda Young. Uh, yes, um, Chairman Chen, I would also support um, our uh, asking our city council to take a position on uh, the CPUC's uh, recent proposed changes to um, our NIM metering. So um, I would like to see that also. Um, and um, another matter that, and I don't really have it refined, um, but I, I remember at, uh, I believe it was last month, um, Michelle gave a presentation on where we are on our climate action goals, on our CAP goals. And um, when it came to our landfill, uh, we're not much is being reduced. And I mean, I, I my recollection, I remember reading that about 8% of our, not necessarily Albany, but overall about 8% um, uh, or, or percentage of emissions are related to landfill. I can't remember the percentage now, but um, I was concerned that we're not reducing any of our landfill. And I also, I, I walk frequently along Solano Avenue and also at Albany Beach. And I am really struck by the huge amount of plastic litter all over the place. Um, and I know that Berkeley um, passed a single use uh, food, wear and litter reduction ordinance in 2019, it went into effect in 2020. And although I don't have the details, I have a friend who's on the El Cerrito um, Environmental Committee and she said El Cerrito had passed something similar. So I just like to throw out there that uh, Albany consider it doing something like that to um, reduce the amount of plastic foodware litter that I'm seeing all the time. I'm picking it up all the time on the streets. and um, what I, I read recently, the 8% was approximately 8% of our uh, carbon emissions are related to plastic. So it's not a huge number, but is this fairly, it's not something to be dismissed. And when you look at, at what's happening, uh, it's 8% now, but it's radically increased over the last five years and it's continuing to exponentially increase. So just wanna throw that out there as a possible future agenda item. Thank you. Great, I don't currently see any other members of the public with their hand raised. Back to you, Chair Fassoon. Okay, if no one else has anything any future agenda items they would like to request. And I think we can go on to item eight, which is just next meeting will be June 15th. Um, and with that, I think we can adjourn the meeting. All right. Thank you all. Thanks. Bye.